welcome to the Great God Debate hosted by the Well Club here at UCR. Happy you're here tonight. My name is uh, Joshua Thompson. I'm part of the Well Club here on campus. Tonight I'll play a small part in the Q&A facilit facilitating it here at the end of the night. And at this time, I would like to introduce to you the moderator of this event. He's currently pursuing his PhD in physics here at UCR. Let's welcome Graham Cron. All right, good evening and welcome to tonight's debate. Uh, the question before us is, does God exist? Now, philosophers and theologians down through the centuries have recognized that the question of God's existence is one of the most profound questions to all of humanity. This is the single most important question we could ask because the answer informs the rest of our explanations. Both debaters tonight understand that either God does exist or that God does not exist. They, however, have each reached radically different conclusions. They both understand that if God exists, he exists independently of whether anyone thinks so or not. Not, not merely a contingent being subject to the projection of our human consciousness. Notice that the question tonight is not, do I believe in God, or even do I think that God exists? As interesting as these questions may be, the more fundamental question is, does God in fact exist? And that is the question we'll be exploring tonight. So that is to say, does a mind-independent supernatural reality exist? This is the real question of the debate tonight. Therefore, we would ask everyone to check their opinions at the door and evaluate the arguments and evidence tonight with an open mind. The purpose of tonight's debate is to hear reasons for and against God's existence through an open and public exchange of ideas. We would encourage everyone to reflect on this most important question both together and individually, and then begin to think through what position is most rational. With that being said, let me now introduce our speakers. To my right is Lenny Esposito. He is the founder and president of Come Reason Ministries. He has authored over 100 articles dealing with intellectually strenuous topics involving the interplay and relationship between God, philosophy, theology, and science. He also releases a monthly apologetics podcast and more information can be found on him on his website, comereason.org. To my left is Richard Carrier. He obtained his PhD from Columbia University in ancient history. He is a world-renowned author and speaker, as well as a professional historian, published philosopher, and prominent defender of the American free thought movement. One of his, his most popular books is Sense and Goodness Without God, A Defense of Metaphysical Naturalism. Please join me in welcoming the speakers tonight. Also, both speakers will have tables set up after the debate to sell books and other materials, so be sure to stop by afterwards and talk to the speakers and get autographs and so forth. So the, now let me go over the format of the debate tonight. The debate tonight will consist of four rounds of descending length two 20-minute opening speeches, two 12-minute rebuttals, two eight-minute counter rebuttals, and two five-minute closing speeches. Once the debate begins, it will proceed uninterrupted until the end. Now, in order to be fair, there will be a timekeeper who is sitting in the front row who will be alerting the speakers when their time is up. If either speaker goes over the time limit, I will be forced to interrupt and cut them off for the sake of fairness. Now, immediately following the debate, we will have a brief time for questions and answers from the audience. So we would ask that everyone please be thinking of a question that you would like to ask the speakers after the debate part of this evening is over. So now at this time, I would ask that everyone would turn off your cell phones and please reserve your applause for the time in between speeches. We would also ask that you would respect both speakers and listen carefully to the arguments that they present here tonight. We are very thankful that they have taken the time to be here tonight and to share their arguments with us. So we'd ask that everyone would be here to evaluate these arguments with an open mind and be respectful of the speakers. Now, with that being said, as is traditional in debate format, the affirmative side goes first. So let the debate begin.
Well, thank you to the staff and students of the University of California, Riverside, for facilitating the debate this evening, uh, for Graham Cron and the Well Christian Club uh, for putting it together. I'd also like to thank Richard uh, for taking his time and willingness to debate such an important topic as the one set before us tonight. Human beings, from the dawn of recorded history, have always sought to find answers to the big questions of life. Does God exist is one of those questions. And how one answers it impacts all aspects of life. It's more important in the 21st century than it has ever been before. In fact, the advancements we see in science, like octomoms or human cloning experiments in the lab, haven't diminished the question of God. In fact, they've truly underscored it. Our advancements should make us think harder about how we should be living and where human values come from. Well, since we're investigating the question of God's existence tonight, I wish to approach my argument like any good investigator would. Now, if you're a fan of television crime dramas, you're familiar with the concept of crime scene investigation. Investigators compile evidence, then they use their reasoning skills in order to piece together the best explanation for the facts of the case. Well, what I want to do tonight is something akin to that. I want to investigate whether God ex exists using evidence, and reason. I will be arguing for two primary contentions tonight. Number one, that there is good evidence that lines up and points to the existence of God. And number two, that there is no good evidence to point to the non-existence of God. Now, if Richard is to make his case that God does not exist, it's not enough for him to withhold belief in God's existence. He will need to provide evidence as well for why this is so. But I'll leave it to uh, Richard to provide his case. For the positive argument for God's existence, what I'm about to offer is what is known as a cumulative case argument. That's where several individual arguments all point to the same answer. This evening, I will provide six different lines of solid evidence, each pointing to God's existence. In order for Richard to be successful, he cannot simply throw out a possible objection to each argument, but he must show why each of the arguments fails, and he can al also would need to make a unified case of how all these facts I offer happened without a God, without also being ad hoc. So my first line of evidence is the creation of the universe. Well, in the last half century or so, modern cosmology has been making tremendous strides in studying our universe. And one of the more well-established facts that they have discovered is that our universe has not been around forever. I want to take a moment to provide some supporting evidence, some philosophical, some scientific, that all matter, energy, space, and time are known to have a beginning at some point in the past. First of all, recent discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics show that the universe has come into being at a specific point in the past. Since the 1920s, a wealth of discoveries have showed that the universe is expanding in all directions. And it's now an accepted consensus that the universe had a starting point called the Big Bang, where all space and matter were at one point packed into a single, highly ordered entity called a singularity. So the question becomes, if there was a Big Bang, what was it that banged, and why? Well, it is true that out of nothing, nothing comes. Now, this is one of the most fundamental laws in science. We simply do not see things popping into existence for no reason. I mean, every parent understands when he sees crayon marks on the wall or mud traipsed across the floor that something happens. If he asked the child and they respond, it just appeared there, he would rightly reject it as silly. Uh, Richard has argued in the past that the universe we experience is actually part of a recurring cycle of creation events. It's been running an indefinitely long time, an infinitely long time. But this is illogical too. See, infinity is a concept that mathematicians use when they speak of a boundless set. So when we speak of a line that stretches to infinity, or perhaps a number like pi that can go on to infinity, that's fine. However, infinity is a shorthanded way of explaining that the set cannot be contained. Um, it's fine as a concept, but when you look at the real world, an actually infinite set of things is impossible to have. We know this because it leads to logically contradictory ideas, as mathematician David Hilbert has demonstrated. If the universe is part of an infinitely long cycle of creation events, we can see these logical problems surface. For example, an infinite pass would be like a bottomless pit. There's simply no stopping point. It makes no sense to say that one can jump from this point 
to the bottomless, uh, from a bottomless pit up to this point. There's no bottom from which to start jumping, and no matter how high you jump, you'll never reach the top. The concept of traversing an actual infinite past is just the same problem. You can't jump out of a bottomless pit. One simply cannot accomplish such a feat. Therefore, the universe must have had some beginning in time. Well, we know that the universe can't be infinitely old. We know that it had a beginning. And if it had a beginning, it must have had a cause for that beginning. For out of nothing, nothing comes, as we've said. So we shape our argument as thus. Whatever begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. Therefore, the universe has a cause. And because all physical matter, space, and even time itself were part of that creation, the cause must therefore be something that's immaterial, outside of space, and timeless. Now, there are only two types of things we know of that fit this criteria. One of those is abstract objects, like the number two or the law of non-contradiction. Uh, but the problem with these are the abstract objects simply can't make anything happen. You can't, the idea of evenness can't turn an odd number of apples into an even number of apples. These are simply ways we use to explain other things. The only other thing we know of that fits these criteria is being immaterial, being outside of space and being timeless, is a mind. See, a mind has the added advantage of being able to exert a will to make a decision. Therefore, a mind is the best answer to why there is something rather than nothing. My second line of evidence, the universe is precisely tuned for life. Now, my second piece of evidence for God's existence is just how finely tuned for life the universe is. Imagine, if you will, you're lost in a threatening wood. Um, there's wild animals and extreme temperatures. Your very survival depends on finding some shelter. By chance, you happen to stumble on a cabin in the clearing of the forest. Crawling through an open window, you quickly hurry inside, thankful for your good luck, and luck is all you suppose this to be. However, as you start to explore the cabin, your attitude begins to change. First, you notice there's fresh food in the kitchen, and that food is all your favorite kinds. Then, you see there are some medical supplies in the bathroom. They're exactly what you need. Not only bandages for your cuts and scrapes, but insulin doses perfect for your diabetes. In the bedroom, three reading books are on the table, and your favorite books happen to be those three. The reading glasses are your exact prescription. Finally, you go to the front door, but it's locked. On a hunch, you pull out the only key you have in your pocket and try it. The key unlocks the door, and it, you're able to enter and exit effortlessly. Now, given such a scenario, you would come to the conclusion that this is not a random cabin at all. You'd start looking for Ashton Kutcher, because you must have been punked. <laughs> well, when scientists have looked at the initial conditions and laws of the universe, they found something very similar to our cabin. The universe is very specifically designed for intelligent life. We can start by looking at the laws that affect the objects in our universe. Now, in their landmark book, The Anthropic Cosmological Principle, Frank Barrow and Paul Tipler offer several examples of laws that are finely tuned for life, including the gravitational constant and the strong nuclear force that holds all matter together. But beyond just the laws, we also have the fundamental constants that govern just how much items in our universe are affected by these laws. Constants such as how much attraction objects have or how rapidly the universe is expanding itself. Lastly, we see the initial distribution of mass and energy of the Big Bang needed to be just right in order for our universe to, su to sustain life. Each of these categories is so delicately balanced that Robin Collins says it is, quote, easier to hit a single proton from the deep recesses of space than to get these conditions just right. Now, we may take it for granted that these values exist. Maybe we think that none of these conditions are necessary at all. In fact, physicist Paul Davies says our universe could have turned out much differently than it did. He writes, quote, you might be tempted to suppose that any old rag bag of laws would produce a complex universe of some sort with attendant inhabitants convinced of their own specialness. Ah, not so. It turns out that randomly selected laws lead almost inevitably either to an unrelieved chaos or a boring and uneventful simplicity. Our own universe is poised exquisitely between these two unpalatable alternatives. See, if the universe itself is put together correctly to support life, then we can't stop at the universe as an explanation for our existence. We have to go to something or someone beyond the universe who existed before the universe someone who designed the universe with the purpose of creating it so that humanity can live and thrive in it. 
The design of the universe argues for the existence of God. Third line of evidence. Life itself shows the fingerprints of intelligence. In all of human existence, it's been readily understood that life comes from life, since at no time have humans ever observed anything else. And now, science has amassed even more evidence for the absolute uniqueness of living systems as non-random information-bearing systems. Human beings have consistently recognized that highly specified information, that's from cave drawings to computer systems, are always the result of an intelligent mind. The identifying features of intelligence are their complex systems, they're specifically arranged to perform a function, and they are highly contingent. That means that nothing forces the patterns to emerge as they do. You see, code breakers in World War II and scientists who search for extraterrestrial life both use the same criteria in separating what is natural and what is the sign of a mind at work. Now, when we look inside living cells, we see that they exhibit the same marks of intelligence. For example, some of the simplest bacteria have a DNA molecule, which is about 4 million nucleotides long. These nucleotides need to be in just the right order, or the bacteria could not live. In fact, Gustav Arrhenius states that there are more possible nucleotide sequences than there are atoms in the universe, yet these are ordered perfectly in living systems to build the proteins necessary for life. Secondly, amino acids, the workhorses that build proteins, are selected perfectly too. Amino acids are what are known as handed. That is, they occur in two shapes that mirror each other, kind of like a left and a right hand. Each of these types is equally distributed in nature. The odds of each is 50%, and each of them bond with the RNA molecule equally well. But all biological systems, uh, all biological proteins must use only left-handed amino acids for life to exist. So how can you have an RNA molecule form randomly, but only select the left-handed acids? Given that bacteria, for example, are four million nucleotides long, how can they assemble by chance to use only left-handed acids? Now, these and other reasons are why MIT mathematician Murray Eden has stated that chance emergence of life from non-life is impossible. Francis Crick, the co-discoverer of DNA, also famously stated, quote, the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a miracle, end quote. You see, DNA and molecular systems required for life, they are specific and complex enough to rule out chance. And since complex systems that are also specific is a sign of an intelligent mind, then it's reasonable to hold that an intelligence is responsible for life. My fourth line of evidence, the appearance of consciousness. Because we recognize that sentient beings exist, that is, that there are people and animals capable of sensing and responding meaningfully to the world around us, we must somehow account for this emergence of consciousness. Like life itself, experience has shown that consciousness only comes from consciousness. It can't be explained by a mere ordering of parts. In fact, Gottfried Leibniz argued this by showing that in any assembly of parts, one cannot point to the interaction of two pieces and say, ah, this is where the consciousness is created here. Even recent medical procedures prove the same fact. There is a treatment of epilepsy patients where neurosurgeons will remove one entire hemisphere of the patient's brain. But the patient doesn't become half conscious. His mechanics may be inhibited a little bit, but he's fully aware and he's alert and able to interact with the world. No, consciousness only arises from pre-existing consciousness. Therefore, our minds must ultimately have their origin in a first mind. My fifth line of evidence, objective moral values exist. Now, morality is a key component of what it means to be human. The fact that there are at least some standards to which all human beings should adhere is well recognized across all cultures. Morality is real and must be rooted in an objective reality beyond our natural world. First, we know that morality cannot be merely a human convention. It differs from other types of societal norms, such as understanding which side of the road is proper to drive on. While driving on the wrong side of the road is illegal, what makes it the wrong side is simply a social construct, an agreement between people to ensure safety and smooth flow of traffic. I mean, it makes no sense to say that Americans are immoral for driving on the right side of the road, while those in the UK and Australia are behaving morally upright because they drive on the left. Again, these are societal norms that help us to get about our business. No, morality is something different than this, and therefore morality cannot be derived from nature or natural law. It can't be thought of 
as only stemming from some evolutionary framework to benefit our survival as a species. In fact, the atheist philosopher Michael Roos clearly understood this when he said that if evolution is true, then morality doesn't really exist. Roos argued that morality, quote, simply does not work unless we believe it is objective. Darwinian theory shows that, in fact, morality is a function of subjective feelings. But it all shows also that we have and must have the illusion of objectivity, end quote. So according to Roos, if morality stems from an evolutionary framework, it is not real. It's only a, a useful fiction. But if it's not real, then it can't be considered binding. No, morality is a completely different kind of thing than this. We recognize that heinous acts, such as torturing a weaker individual only for the pleasure of it, is an objectively evil thing to do. It's wrong for all people across all ages, regardless of whether they thought so or not. Thus, moral laws are considered prescriptive. They are how anyone at any place and any time should behave given a specific set of circumstances. And we can recognize such laws as real, not simply made up to propagate the race. In order for moral laws to be prescriptive in this way, they must be grounded in something other than social agreement. Therefore, moral laws must have a source that transcends humanity, that is God. But if there is no God, then there are no more real moral values or duties. We know that morals and values and duties exist. Uh, torturing babies for fun is wrong. So it stands to reason that God does exist. My sixth line of evidence, the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. The last piece of evidence I would like to offer for believing in the ex existence of God is the historical record for the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, Jesus' life and impact on humanity cannot be understated. He claimed to be able to speak authoritatively on behalf of God, and he said that he would validate his claim by rising from the dead. Now, Richard has said in his writings that Jesus never existed at all, but this is not a position held by the vast majority of scholars, even atheist scholars. They believe that Jesus truly did exist, and we can know at least some things about his life on earth. As noted New Testament scholar and historian Michael Lacona has written, we can identify three facts about Jesus' resurrection accounts that are both strongly supported by the data and acknowledged as facts by a near unanimous consensus of scholars, from the very liberal to the very conservative. Lacona lists these as fact number one, Jesus died by crucifixion. Fact number two, very shortly after Jesus' death, his disciples had experiences that led them to believe that Jesus had been resurrected and had appeared to them. And fact number three, the Christian persecutor Paul dramatically converted to Christianity. Paul stated the reason for his conversion is because he too experienced the risen Jesus. Now those who recognize these facts but seek to circumvent the conclusion of a resurrection, well, they've offered other explanations such as, well, Jesus merely swooned and didn't die, or the disciples conspired to steal the body, or it was a mass hallucination, things of this sort. However, these explanations have been shown to be fatally flawed and are rejected by contemporary scholarship. It seems, given the evidence of the facts we have before us, it is reasonable to believe that Jesus of Nazareth really was raised from the dead, validating his authority to speak on behalf of God. And we can conclude from that that God really does exist. Okay, to summarize my arguments tonight, I've offered six different lines of evidence for the existence of God, each holding its own facts underneath them. The first is the beginning of the universe, the fine-tuning of the universe for advanced life, the appearance of life on earth, the appearance of consciousness in higher animals, the existence of morality, and the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. Now, for Richard to prove that God does not exist, he'll need to provide some evidence of his own for God's non-existence. For if my arguments don't work, well, God very, may, very well may ex still exist. I'm just a poor arguer. Um, the best we can do in such a circumstances is become neutral on the belief. But if Richard has no arguments to this end, and I do, then rational, a rational person is more justified in believing in God than believing in the non-existence of God. Thank you. All right, thanks. And thank you for everybody for coming. This is a huge turnout, it's great. Uh, and I, I think I'm very grateful for all the organization and all the staff. There's been quite a lot of help from the volunteers, so this is a really awesome event, thank you. Uh, okay, so let's deal with the arguments. Um, 
And the first thing I want to point out is that it doesn't necessarily incumbent upon me to provide evidence for atheism. I mean, if we say that aliens don't exist, I don't have to prove to you that they don't exist. You need to prove to me that they do. Or if there's fairies in the woods or demons and so forth. The, cl the claimant has to actually establish the fact. We, we don't necessarily have to have evidence against the proposition. Nevertheless, we do have evidence against the proposition, as I'll get to. His first argument uh, is that the creation of the universe. He starts with the space-time had a beginning argument. This has actually been rejected by scientists. This is old news. Uh, that the Hawking-Penrose theorem was the theorem originally that argued that the universe must have begun at a singularity, but both Hawking and Penrose have both agreed that that theorem was false because quantum mechanics makes it impossible. So we don't actually know that space-time itself began with the Big Bang. We just know that the observable universe that we're in began at the Big Bang. We don't know what occurred before it. So we can't actually establish that the universe had a beginning. And also, mathematicians will tell you, any, any PhD in mathematics will tell you that an actual infinite is possible. There's nothing that actually makes that impossible. It could be extended infinite time into the past. If I hold up my finger here and show it to you, geometrically, there's an infinite number, an actual infinite number of points on my fingernail. So you're looking at an actual infinity right now. So you can't really say that it is impossible. And the same with a series, infinite series of the past. You don't have to start at the beginning and leap to any point in the middle. If you have an infinite string of pearls, you can't say that, that none of the pearls on that string exist. Obviously, they all exist. If each pearl is a universe with a big bang at the beginning of it, then obviously we could exist in an infinite string of big bang uh, universes. So there's nothing impossible about that. It's not illogical. With regard to uh, the nature of the universe, it's supposed to be finely tuned uh, for life. It really isn't. Uh, I want you to think about the cosmology and astrophysics here for a moment. 99.9999%. That's a large percentage. That percentage of the universe is filled with a lethal radiation-filled vacuum. Life can't exist in it. So that means the vast quantity of the universe is inhospitable to life, lethal to life. If you take, take that aside and just look at the other material that's in the universe, 99.9999% of that is, consists of stars and black holes on which life cannot live. So the vast amount of the material in the universe is inhospitable to life. And even if you look at the remaining stuff, most of that is also inhospitable to life. In fact, if you do the math, if you put the entire universe, the observable universe, into a house, the amount of volume in that house that would be hospitable to life would be smaller than a proton. Now, if you walked into a house and there was only one proton in there that was hospitable to life, you would not conclude that that, that house was designed for life. The universe is clearly not designed for life. And an important point of this is that Let's flip this around. Let's look at how it would actually be. Now, if there is no God that designed the universe that designed life, what is the only universe that we could see? Now, first of all, it would mean that life is a chemical accident. He talked about that in the beginning of life. Life is a chemical accident. It's a very improbable accident. That's true. Uh, that means for something like that to happen, the universe has to be really old and really big. So there's lots of chemistry sets practicing and experimenting with creating molecules before one of them will come up. It's like a lottery. The odds of winning a lottery are low, but if you have a million people playing the lottery, one of them is going to win. So if you see a lottery win, you should expect that there's going to be millions of players. And that's the case here. The only universe that we could see ourselves in is a universe that's vastly old and vastly huge and has vast amounts of material in it and has lots of chemistry sets experimenting. And yet, look, that's the universe we see. So in fact, the godless hypothesis actually predicts observations about the universe that are confirmed. And those are observations that we couldn't predict from the God hypothesis. I mean, why would God need a universe that's 99.99999% inhospitable to life? Why would he make a house that's completely lethal to life except for one little proton in it? Uh, the godless hypothesis predicts this. The uh, God hypothesis does not. Now, with regard to uh, life itself, you know, evolution, you can go look this up, Google it. Uh, I, don't, I don't really need to defend it. The science is really well established. We can explain all the life on Earth by appeal to evolution by natural selection. The, the only thing that you might look at is, well, then how did it all begin? It had to begin with that random molecular accident. And that's probably what it was. It was probably a very simple uh, organism. He talked about like these really complex uh, pieces in cells, but those are highly evolved. And I want you to think about this for a moment. Single-celled organisms have been on this planet evolving six times longer than multi-celled organisms. That means a bacteria is six times more evolved than you are. So I want you to think about that. And it, was, it evolved all through that time before it even got around to having the machinery capable of making multi-celled life. So that's a really, really long time of evolution. So, and all of that machinery evolved slowly over that time. The first life was a much simpler, much simpler molecule. So we don't really have a problem explaining that. And in fact, that's exactly what we should expect to see. If there is no God who designed life, who just, you know, 
you could talk about the Adam and Eve story if you want or whatever. If God designed life, he wouldn't sit around twiddling his thumbs waiting for single-celled organisms to evolve six times longer for three billion years, by the way. Three billion years, and then suddenly, oh, okay, you know what? We need multi-celled life. I, I don't know why I didn't think of that before. Uh, but if there is no God, that's exactly what we have to see. You have to see a huge amount of evolution of single-celled organisms before they become complex enough to form multi-celled life. Uh, and then, of course, multi-celled life evolved for 500, billion years, or 500 million years before it got to evolve us. So this kind of huge scale of time, of slow evolution over time, is exactly what atheism predicts, but it's not what the God hypothesis predicts. Um, and he talks about other things like handedness and things like that, but we have explanations. If you look in Sense and Goodness Without God, I have a section on biogenesis that explains all of these things, how uh, homo chirality exists, why the, the molecules have the same handedness and things like that. I won't go into detail on that. It's not necessary. The science is available for you. You can look it up. So let's get to consciousness. Um, he says consciousness only comes from consciousness. I'm not aware of that being the case. Uh, sperm is not conscious, so... Uh, neither is the egg. So consciousness comes from the formation of a brain in a womb. It takes a while to build one. Um, and we have evidence, in fact, that it is, does come from the brain, that we need a brain to do it. Uh, not, not only do we have uh, lots of evidence from the fact that you know, when people die, there's no consciousness around, but we can also break it. We can break your consciousness. We can go into your brain, if a bullet can go through your brain, or a doctor or a surgeon can go into your brain and cut out a piece of it, and you'll lose that function. For example, there's a part of your brain that recognizes faces. We can cut that out and then you can't recognize faces anymore. You've lost a part of your consciousness. So, uh, and you can take, there's every single thing that we do, every single, single thing, the, the, the vision, the seeing of color, the seeing of red, there's a location in the brain where that is. We can cut it out and then you won't have it anymore. So we know there's actual machinery that's actually generating this stuff. Now we don't know, we don't have a full theory yet exactly how it does that, but we know a lot of evidence that points to the fact that it is something going on inside the brain mechanically, chemically, that's producing consciousness. There's a lot of science to back that up. And once again, this actually argues for atheism because a God wouldn't need, you to, wouldn't need to give you a very fragile, large, energy-consuming brain to have consciousness. He could just give you a soul. You know, your brain consumes 20% of the energy uh, that you eat. So you have to eat more. You have to waste a lot of energy. You have to breathe more in order to keep that brain working and generating consciousness. But if you had a soul, you wouldn't need that brain. Likewise, think how fragile a brain is, brain damage, how easily it is to, to destroy or uh, disrupt someone's reasoning with chemicals or with injuries. But if you had a soul, you couldn't be injured. You'd have a, a well-functioning brain or well-functioning mind all the time. But on atheism, the only way you could have consciousness is from an extremely complex machine like the brain. And the brain is extremely complex. Uh, it has a specified complexity that's greater than 10 to the power of 5 million. And if you know anything about math, you realize that's an extremely complex organ. And why do we need this extra, extremely large, complex organ, this energy hog? Well, it's because on atheism, only that kind of thing could produce something as complex as consciousness. So atheism actually predicts that you would have a huge, complex brain if you're conscious, because that's the only way you could be. But if God exists, that wouldn't be necessary. Uh, then we get to moral values. Um, he talks about the, going on the wrong side of the road as a social construct, whether it's left or right. Uh, in England, it's one, and here it's the other. But notice, you have to pick a side. You can't have people willy-nilly going on one side or the other. That's the traffic system wouldn't work. And that's an objective fact about traffic systems. You have to have sightedness. You have to pick left or right as the standard side to drive on. And that evolves or that emerges from the natural facts, the physical facts. And morality is just like this. He says it's not, but no, it is in fact like that. Morality is no different. Morality derives from what we have to do to have a functional and desirable society, a society we want to live in. Do you want to live in the murder capital of the world, Juarez, Mexico, or do you want to live here, which is a substantially better place to live? And if you look at place to place to place, what is a better place, a worse place, it is a direct function of the moral behavior of the people in it. And that's what you have to do. It's just like littering. I can't expect to live in a clean environment, a clean city, if I'm the one, if I'm also littering. Now, of course, that means everybody has to refrain from littering to keep litter off of the streets. But everyone includes me, so I have to actually participate in that. So if I want a clean society, I have to participate in that. And that's the same with morality. If I want a, a society I want to live in, I have to participate in creating that society. There isn't any other way to do it. And there are other reasons I talk about in Sense and Goodness Without God as to why we should be moral and what motivates us to be moral. As social animals that we've evolved to be, we actually are happier as moral animals internally. Uh, as com the Compassion itself is actually a source of pleasure and can actually make our lives better and more fulfilling if we live by that way, rather than living an empty life. And this is the nature of social animals all throughout the animal kingdom. And then he talks about resurrection. 
Uh, he mentions three facts uh, that Jesus died. That's fine. And that could have happened. I don't, uh, I don't actually uh, insist that it's certain that Jesus didn't exist. He may have done. Uh, I think the evidence tends the other way, but it's, uh, the evidence is very uncertain. So it's quite possible that there was a Jesus who died. Then, but then he says that uh, his disciples had experiences. And he says there's a near unanimous agreement by scholars. Well, yeah, that's because most of those scholars concur that these were visions and hallucinations, that they were resurrection revelations. And Paul himself is our only eyewitness source who actually says and describes anything to do with what these experiences were like. And he says it was a revelation of Jesus Christ. He says it was a vision. And in the book of Acts, it actually says that it was just a, a light in the sky, that he actually saw a vision of a bright light uh, and a voice talking to him. So, uh, and we have lots of pagans in this period, even eyewitness uh, accounts by pagans in this period, who also saw their gods, uh, had visions of them, and so on. Uh, this is actually a common religious phenomenon. It has psychological explanations. The fact that everybody's seeing different gods is kind of pretty conclusive evidence that they're not seeing the god. They're seeing something else that their mind is generating. And the, what they see is always culturally predetermined. So you can look for what the Chinese people are hallucinating. They're hallucinating Chinese gods, and, and Greeks are hallucinating Greek gods, and the Jews are hallucinating Jewish gods, or Jewish angels, as the case may be. Uh, that kind of pretty much tells you that the source there is cultural, not uh, supernatural. And then he mentions that Paul dramatically converted. Um, actually, this is kind of evidence against uh, the validity of the resurrection theory. Out of the hundreds, if not thousands, of opponents of the church, only one guy changed his mind. Now, I want you to think about that. Uh, the probability that there would be one person that might, real, might feel guilt at what he was doing to the Christians or might realize that the Christians had a really good idea for reforming society or whatever the case may be and may have had one of these religious experiences. Maybe he fasted and got himself into an altered state of consciousness and his guilt to overwhelm him, and he actually had an experience, a subconscious experience, of God telling him, you know, you're wrong, you should really get with these Christians, and he converted. Now, you'd think that would be unlikely. Well, yeah, unlikely means infrequent, which means there's only going to be a few of them. Well, there was only one. That's few. Uh, so, in fact, on the atheist hypothesis, we, the prediction is fulfilled, but we actually we should expect to see few people like Paul. Paul is alone, so we see few people like Paul. Now, if Jesus was God and actually wanted to appear to people and actually wanted to convert persecutors of Christianity, he could have appeared to all of them. Why didn't he? Uh, a God can do that. But natural hallucinations are only going to appear, only going to occur to certain few people, and that's exactly what we observe to be the case. Um, now, this is actually an adequate refutation of everything you said. How much time do I have? All right, seven minutes. Hang on. Let's see what else I can pick on. Um, oh, yes, out of nothing, nothing comes. That's another one. Um, if there is absolutely nothing, then there are no rules governing what will happen. Uh, so the, the idea that not only nothing can come from nothing, well, that's a rule. That's something. That's not nothing. If, if you really have absolutely nothing, then anything can happen. Nothing governs what's going to happen. So we have no idea. If we start with nothing, we have no idea what, what could occur. As uh, physicists will tell you, like Victor Stenger in The Fallacy of Fine-Tuning, Nothing is inherently unstable. So if, if we actually did start the universe with nothing, we could actually expect something to come of it because uh, the probability of nothing remaining nothing is actually rather low because there's nothing governing what will happen. Oh, and I'll also point out uh, this fine-tuning point. Um, supposedly, it's very improbable for the, fine co for the constants to be arranged a certain way. In fact, we don't really know this. Um, there, are infinitely, there are infinitely many number of possible constants, forces, particles, and so on that we can imagine that are logically possible. And there is simply no computer that exists that's capable of calculating how many of those would produce life-bearing universes. So we actually can't generate a valid, honest statistic here. We don't know how often uh, randomly picked universes will generate life. But it's worth pointing out that we do know that a mind, as in, the human intelligence, requires a specified complexity of 10 to the power of 5 million. More than that, actually. That's, that's a lower bound estimate. That's actually the specified complexity uh, of a monkey, I think it is. So uh, think about this. You, you can get all the random gods that you could just happen to have had. Uh, most of those random gods are going to be gibbering idiots, right? They're going to be cognitively dysfunctional. Their, their thoughts and so forth are going to be wired up the wrong way. Uh, but the odds of you getting a human-level mind out of all of the minds that you could pick at random 
uh, the odds of that are extremely low. So in fact, you're betting on a huge coincidence that you just got incredibly lucky. You just got this amazing, not only just a human level intelligence that just existed for no reason, but you've got this vast super intelligence that existed for no reason. That to me is fine tuning. I mean, that's, that's betting on a huge coincidence. Uh, whereas when we look at the evidence, the evidence matches what we, what we would see if there was no God. We see this vastly inhospitable universe. We see this huge uh, timeline where life takes forever to evolve and is very extremely rare and can barely hold on onto the planets and where it's adapted to where it is. I mean, the reason we breathe oxygen is not because oxygen was conveniently here. The reason we breathe oxygen is because we learned how to, we adapted to it, the animals adapted to it. Oxygen was originally a poison. It wasn't a natural uh, part of the atmosphere except in very small concentrations. When plants and algae started generating o toxic oxygen, other animals evolved to start breathing it. And that's why that happened. So we adapted to the environment that we're in. Uh, that's not intelligent design. That's the other way around. That's, that's uh, making the best of what you've got. And I'll point out that when he, he quoted Crick as saying that life, the origin of life, is almost a miracle, I will ask you to emphasize and pay note the word almost. Uh, kind of tells you right there where Crick is. Um, the fact of the matter is it's not that improbable. We can come up with a statistic of something like uh, 10 to the power of 40, uh, but something can have occurred in this universe that's as improbable as one times 10, or one in 10 to the power of 150. And now if you know anything about math, 10 to the power of 40, there's gonna be tons and tons of those events occurring in this universe just by random chance alone. That's how huge this universe is. It's huge. Uh, and how old it is, it's vastly old. So there's lots of room for these kinds of random events, no matter how improbable they are. There's, uh, we can get small molecules that are self-replicating that are within the realm of probability. Where am I on time? Three minutes, okay. Um, I might wanna say something more about morality. Um, let me do that, because I think this is an important one. Uh, the idea of morality uh, being evidence for God, um, I disagree with that. I think we need a functional society, we all of us do. We need the trustworthy company of each other, and we also need uh, the feeling of compassion, we need this. Um, as social animals, we've evolved these properties, and there's a reason for it. But whatever the reason is, nevertheless, we're with it. When I, compassion means feeling with someone, so when you are a compassionate person and you do a, a kind act, you actually share in the joy that you've created. Whereas if you do a cruel act, you share in the suffering that you've created. Now, the opportunity to share in that joy is something that adds value to your life. You actually find your life more satisfying that way. If you shut yourself off from that, you're actually making your life more of a waste. You're actually not, uh, not going to have a more fulfilling life. You're not gonna have a satisfying life in the same way that you would. So consciousness, I'm sorry, compassion is important in this respect. It actually gives you a direct pleasure reward and makes your life worth living. And I don't think you need a god for this. You just need a society for this. You just need a socially evolved animal for this, an animal that's conscious and consciously aware of other people, that can experience feelings about other people and can share through mirror neurons and other structures in the brain, can actually experience what other people are experiencing and actually share the universe with them. Uh, this is an amazing thing, but it's not a, d a divine supernatural miracle. Uh, we are lucky. Uh, and we should take advantage of the fact that we, we have this, this good fortunate opportunity to work together to create a, world, a better world. And we don't need a divine God dictating to us how to do that. We can figure that out by just looking at how human bodies work, how human minds work, how the world works. And from that, we can deduce the best way to organize society, the best way for ourselves to behave. And I'll close there. Thank you so much. Well, I'll remind you that in my opening speech, I offered six lines of evidence for the existence of God. That is, the universe began to exist out of nothing, that the universe is finely tuned for the existence of life, that life appeared and we never see life coming from non-life, that consciousness appeared and we never see conscious beings coming from non-conscious materials, that Morality exists, and we need a moral lawgiver in order for morality to exist, and then that there's good evidence for the resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, Richard has attempted to uh, 
answer each one of these things, but I don't think he does a very good job on some of these items. For example, he first argues that an actual infinite of, uh, number of things can exist, and he uses the point on his finger. Well, philosophers have understood this for quite some time, that, that while you can keep subdividing any material space, there may come a point where you can no longer subdivide material reality. Um, it's not an uncommon occurrence in math that we use things such as an actual infinite to solve problems that don't exist in reality. For example, no one can really point to the square root of negative one. Uh, in fact, even retailers talk about negative stock they have on hand, but that doesn't mean when you put something on the shelf, it disappears. Uh, it's just a convention that we use to say that we've promised it to someone else. So the idea of a negative number uh, refers to something that means we can't, uh, we've promised it and it won't stay around. Uh, what Richard is talking about is a potentially infinite set, something that we can continue on towards infinity, but we never arrive there. As an example, uh, imagine a library that holds an infinite number of books. Each is assigned a number. Now, if there were an actually infinite number of books in the library, someone could come in and check out, say, all the odd-numbered books. Well, half the library is gone, but how many books are left? Well, an infinite number, because there's still an infinite number of of even-numbered books. So infinity minus infinity still equals infinity. Now, imagine the library gets books donated at, say, a million books a second. Now, I'm a librarian, and I have to number each one of the books. I goofed. I printed a label for book number infinity plus 13.7 billion. How long do I have to wait before I can use that label? Well, you'll never cross infinity. You'll never get to the end of infinity and start adding 13.7 billion onto it. So I'll never use the label. Similarly, if our universe is 13.7 billion years old, we would never get to it if there was an actual infinite. Such beliefs are simply illogical. For the fine-tuning argument, oh, by the way, um, Richard has said that it's entirely possible that our universe is simply one of a multitude that are continually being generated. He says science has shown this. In fact, science has shown quite the opposite. Scientists Arvin Bord and Alexander Vilenkin have proven that it doesn't matter which description of the universe one chooses, any model of the universe requires a past space-time boundary. The theorem is true regardless of the physical description of the universe prior to its beginnings. Vilenkin writes, quote, with the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind past eternal universes. There's no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. And even just as recently as December, Vilenkin and Audrey Mathani released yet another proof showing that the three most popular scenarios offered today, which try to circumvent these theorems, uh, all of them fall apart and they still have to be uh, a universe that has an actual beginning. Mathani and Vilenkin state, we have addressed three scenarios which seem to be a way to avoid a beginning and have found none of them can actually be eternal in the past. On to the fine-tuning argument. Uh, Richard says that uh, the fine-tuning is really not such a big deal after all. Well, again, uh, most of the science that is out there today actually argues against this. For example, the gravitational constant, which is how much masses will be attracted to one another, could sit in a range anywhere of 1 times 10 to the 40. That's 10 with 40 zeros after it. But if you were to change that gravitational constant, with one part in a billion, 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 advanced life on Earth would be crushed, according to Cambridge Royal Society research professor Martin Rees. Barrow and Tipler note that if Einstein's cosmological constant varied in either direction by as little as 1 times 10 to the 120th power, which is a fraction so small it'd take more zeros to write than there are atoms in the universe. Um, th if this were to change even by that amount, the universe would expand too fast for galaxies and stars to form. So we see these things. Roger Penrose calculated that the initial distribution of mass and energy of the Big Bang needed to be 1 times 10 times 10 to the 120th power. He said, quote, I cannot even recall seeing anything else in physics whose accuracy is known to approach even remotely a figure like 1 part in 10 times 10 to the 123rd. You can see that this hypothesis is uh, far outweighing uh, any kind of coincidence or even multiple universes. Now, Richard asks, why make the universe so lethal in so many parts? This obviously argues against God. Well, that doesn't follow at all. I mean, picture a ranch, rancher in Texas, a man who lives alone, who has 5,000 acres and 100,000 head of cattle. 
why would one man need so much land that's arid, that's desolate, that he can't survive in? How can you imagine that there's a 5,000 acre ranch only dedicated for one man? Well, maybe it's there because that's what he desired. That serves his purposes. So just because the universe is vast is not an argument against God. People will move great mounds of earth to get to one diamond. You see, it's the value of the thing, not how much space is taken up around it. For the origin of life, again, my f primary point was we have never observed life coming from non-life. And I've not heard Richard answer this point. Now, Richard said, we have evolutionary theory. Evolution's a good model. Well, this is the wrong answer. No matter which theoretical model of evolutionary development one chooses, they'll always be inadequate to explain life. Why is that? That's simply because you already need to be alive for evolution to take place. See, survival of the fittest, natural selection, only works if you're already there and reproducing. What I'm asking is where does the first life come from? To claim evolution created the first life is akin to saying all the parts you need to build the very first ship can be sailed over to the same harbor. It doesn't make any sense. So where else have we seen life come from but non-life? I have seen it nowhere else. Next, I talked about consciousness as being only coming from conscious beings. Now, according to Richard's view, consciousness is merely an electrochemical pattern in the brain. That would mean if science was good enough, they would be able to identify just the right combination of electrical pathways through the brain to produce a thought, say, of love. And imagine a person were to die and a brilliant neurosurgeon were to place some fine electrodes in the corpse's brain and send just the right charge through them. Well, by Richard's definition, does this mean a corpse could be thinking? A corpse could be loving? Um, dead people can think. What an amazing thing. No. Mind cannot be reduced to merely physical processes. Uh, the mind must be something different than the brain. And here's why. It has different properties. Okay? Um, again, we know that minds only come from minds. Properties of minds have thoughts, intentions, desires. None of these things are physical properties, so you can't uh, put them in the category of physical things. Now, Richard says that what about uh, cutting out part of the brain to recognize faces? Isn't that the same? You know, isn't that proving that the mind is the brain? Well, not necessarily. You know, I have a computer at home, and if my video card in my computer gets hot and, and some of the circuits burn out of it, I get a garbled message on my screen. Does that mean my software is bad? No, it doesn't prove that my software doesn't exist or my software only exists in my hardware. It proves that my hardware is corrupting the message that it's trying to receive. So there's a difference between the physical property that's being uh, receiving the message, expressing it, versus the idea that the property itself exists. In fact, as I said, John Hopkins neurosurgeon Jonathan Freeman appeared in an article with Scientific American talking about these girls, these actually uh, patients who underwent these hemispherectomies where one entire half of their brain was removed. Um, Hop, uh, Friedman states, quote, one was a champion bowler after the uh, operation, uh, one was a chess champion of his state, and others are in college doing very nicely. This article shows that neurosurgeons have performed the operation on children as young as three months old. Astonishingly, memory and personality develop normally. So mind can't be merely physical. And Richard hasn't even shown how mind can emerge from physical properties. H2O, water, we can talk about how it would work in a liquid state or a solid state through physical means. But we can't explain desires of the mind in this way. Okay, morality. Um, Mor Richard has claimed that morality drives from the desires of the world in which we want to live. Well, this is my point. This is a subjective view of morality. Richard says that there's only one core value from which all morality stems, an individual's desires for happiness. From this flows compassion and integrity, and then these inform our moral sensibilities. Well, this is why Richard has written uh, things saying that women selling their bodies in the sex, sex trade could be this considered equally moral as female food service workers. Uh, both are simply making money on natural hunger. No, uh, we have to understand that this kind of an idea doesn't really solve certain ethical dilemmas. First, your ethics students will recognize problems that, like, what should you do if you're told to kill one person in order that 10 of your friends should remain alive? There's no way desires for happiness solve these kinds of, uh, of issues. Secondly, it leads to great moral problems. Uh, should death row inmates be put to sleep 
peacefully so that their organs can be painlessly harvested in order to provide good lives for waiting transplant victims. It seems on a desired for happiness worldview that would be considered moral. And then what if people's desire or what if their definition of happiness changes? See, Richard doesn't answer any of these. Uh, for the resurrection of appearances, of course, uh, he claims hallucinations seem to answer both Paul and the disciples. Um, I would say that resurrection appearances cannot be hallucinations. I'll give you three reasons for this. First of all, hallucinations cannot account for the consistency of the reports of the appearances. We have multiple independent sources that are early that attest to Jesus being resurrected and appearing in a physical form. Secondly, hallucinations can't account for the empty tomb reports within the, uh, within the gospel accounts. And hallucinations really don't explain the conversion of Paul. There's no reason why Paul would even want to uh, understand or, or believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. His whole goal was to stamp out Christianity. Uh, now, lastly, all cultures have experiences of their own gods, Richard says. Well, if Jesus' story is not unique, is it therefore false? See, parallels to false tales don't invalidate true claims. It doesn't follow. If any mythical parallel is found, it cancels out the Christian claim since Christianity is rooted in history. Heck, Hollywood does this all the time. It takes a real story, makes a mythical story about it. And uh, with that, I'd like to thank you. He argues against the actual infinite. Um, his arguments don't hold up. Uh, I'm not ta he talks about, for example, when I'm holding up my thumb, that there may be a physical limitation to how much we can cut it up. But we're not talking about that. We're talking about geometric. We're talking about uh, not the physical limitations, but how geometrically you could divide the thumb. You can divide it infinitely many times. There are infinitely many geometric points on the thumb. There's nothing preventing that. Likewise, his argument about labels, the fact that he couldn't physically sit around and wait long enough to put the label, to get that label at the end, is irrelevant. That's a human limitation. We're not talking about what limitations there are in counting infinities. We're talking about whether those infinities can exist. If we can't count an infinity, that doesn't mean there isn't an infinity. And the fact of the matter is, just as I use that example with the pearls on the infinitely long string of pearls, there's no logical contradiction in having that. Likewise, we can have infinite long, infinitely long string of Big Bang universes, one after the other, one becoming the other. There's nothing logically impossible about that. And he says, we would never get to it, but we didn't. We exist only on one of them. We didn't start at the beginning of infinity and then jump all the way to the end. We're only in that one little spot. And there could be people in all of those little spots. There's nothing in, in all of those little areas in the string of, uh, of universes. There's nothing logically impossible about that. Uh, he talks about life never coming from non-life. Uh, that's not really true. Life is just a chemistry set. Um, this is well determined and well understood in, in, in the science of chemistry and biochemistry. Uh, you just put the right chemical parts together, you get life. There's nothing supernatural or miraculous about that. So all you really need is um, a self-replicator. That's all you need, really, is one chemical that self-replicates uh, enough to get evolution started. And he agrees. Like Once you get it started, uh, evolution will proceed. And it takes billions and billions of years, and that's what we observe to be the case. So that confirms that evolution is what's doing it. And we actually have made these self-replicators. We've made really tiny self-replicators that are so simple uh, that they have a probability of being randomly assembled in chemistry pools around uh, the universe. They have a probability of being assembled that's very high given the vast size and age of the universe. Um, <clears throat> so again, uh, it's, it's, uh, we do have evidence of this. Now obviously he says we've never seen it happen, but that's because to, if you can't put it in a vat and sit around and wait, if it's going to take billions and billions of years for the universe to produce, uh, one of these chemicals. Obviously, we're not going to do it in the lab. We, we don't have the budget to, or the time to sit around for billions of years in a lab waiting for it to happen. It's very improbable, but we can determine that probability. We know it's just a chemical. We, we can actually determine the complexity of the chemical. We know it can randomly assemble. We know it can occur in nature. So we have all the facts in place. So there's nothing actually really a problem with that. Uh, he talks about uh, Vilenkin's work. Uh, Vilenkin's work is based on the assumption that physics stays the same in all these universes. Uh, but there isn't, that's kind of self-contradictory. We actually don't know if, if physics changes in, with different universes. So there really isn't any prevention there of, um, of infinite strings of universes. They could exist. It's a possibility, and there are many scientists who will tell you that. Um, the, Victor Stenger, uh, for example, is one of them in his book, Fallacy of Fine-Tuning. 
Uh, he also talks about the fine-tuning, the gravity has to be super fine-tuned. Uh, that's, that's actually incorrect. That's if you vary gravity but keep the electromagnetic force the same. What prevents gravity from crushing you is electromagnetic force. The electrons in your body are pushing against the other atoms and they're keeping you from being crushed by gravity. Now for every, you could pick any random force of gravity. For that force of gravity, there is a force that you could assign to the electromagnetic force that would produce a livable universe. So that means, based on that value alone, half of all the possible combinations of, uh, of arrangements um, of gravitational constants and electromagnetic constants would actually produce livable universes. And uh, a lot of these, these crushing universes, for example, you, they actually, they're like a reset button. If you have a universe where the, the gravitational force is just so vastly larger than the electromagnetic force, or vice versa, you can actually have a situation where the universe rips apart or collapses, resetting the whole thing, and you can actually end up with a different uh, configuration of the universe with a different, uh, different constants of gravity and, and so on. So uh, this is the problem, and, and, and of course those are just two forces. There could be infinitely many other forces that are possible. We don't know all the possible forces that there can be. So the kind of universes you can assemble are beyond our ability to calculate, so we can't actually demonstrate that there are very rare numbers of combinations that produce viable universes. There's, there's, if you take gravitational constant, there could be an infinite number of forces that could exist that could counterbalance gravity. We don't know. The, the possibilities are endless. There's no way to calculate this, so that really doesn't help us, uh, help us much. Uh, he talks about uh, if uh, physical things can't make non-physical things like intentions or feelings, but that just begs the question. Uh, we have plenty of evidence that that's what's going on, in fact, uh, in human minds. Uh, and he talks about if you take a corpse and you, you electrically stimulate it, uh, would that be, would then make it love and so forth? Would it be a loving person and, and things like that? Well, to be more accurate, the brain is more than electro electronics going, elect or electricity going around. It's also chemistry. If you took a brain and actually got the chemistry in the brain to keep, to work again, um, yeah, you just resurrected the person. So yes, they would be a, an actual conscious person. Um, it's not a corpse anymore. That's the definition of a corpse is the chemistry set isn't running. Uh, if you get the chemistry set running again, you've re reanimated the person. And of course, there are people who actually plan to do this to themselves and actually have made arrangements for it. Um, he talks about split brain patients as somehow proving that the, the brain is not physical. Um, well, let me, let me, I don't know if you know the, the actual science of this. Uh, split brain patients, if you cover one of their eyes, and, have, and show them an object, and then you ask them, and then you cover the other eye, and then you show that object again and say, is this the object I showed you? They won't know, because that half of their brain can't talk to this half of their brain. That's physical. Uh, and the reality is, uh, there's a redundancy in the brain. All, there's every part in the brain over here, there's a part over here. Uh, some of them are not, not symmetrical. Uh, so in fact, there are, there are functions that one half of their brain can't perform, and the other half can, because that half has that particular piece in it. Uh, if you have memories that were only stored in one half of the brain, those memories will only be accessible on that half of the brain. So this actually, uh, to me, is evidence that the physicality of the brain. And of course, that's just cutting the corpus callosum, cutting the two halves. If you keep cutting out pieces of the brain, eventually it stops working, which is my point. Uh, that's, if, you, if you take all enough parts out of it, it stops running, just like the engine of a car. And then he goes to individual desires as the source of morality. Well, I hate to break it to you, but that's a fact. Um, it all does come down to what you want, uh, what kind of world you want to live in, what kind of person you want to be. If you didn't desire to be a good person and there was no evidence or anything that I could do to convince you to do that, well, then you wouldn't have any reason to be one. You, there would be no way I could get through to you. Um, so it I always have to appeal. Even a Christian, even a God would have to appeal to desires that you already have. So it does come from individual desires. And he talks about moral dilemmas, uh, for example, uh, organ donors. Would you want to turn prisoners into organ donors just to, to harvest their organs? The fact of the matter is we don't want that to happen to us. Uh, so that's the reason why we make sure it doesn't happen to them, uh, because we know that could be us someday. Uh, we also don't want to live in that kind of society. And we also don't want to be the kind of people who would do that. Uh, we would not be able to live with ourselves. We would not be fulfilled as persons if we were the sort of people who would be that callous and, and, and be, treat people that way. It all comes down to what you want and what sort of person you want to be, what sort of society you want to live in, and uh, what you might want to happen to you if the roles are reversed. Uh, the resurrection, um, about uh, consistency of reports. Uh, they're not consistent, by the way. Uh, you check the reports in the Gospels, and they're not consistent. Uh, moreover, a lot of the reports in there, they didn't even recognize him. They didn't even know he was Jesus. They were talking to him for hours and didn't even know he was Jesus until it occurred to them, you know, I think that was Jesus. Um, that's in the uh, Gospel of Luke. 
in the Gospel of John as well, there were uh, certain disciples who weren't sure it was Jesus and had to like ask Peter, is this, is this Jesus? Uh, and uh, Mary herself uh, turned around and didn't recognize him. She thought he was a gardener uh, and until he spoke, supposedly, and then suddenly she saw Jesus in him. Uh, so there's a lot of inconsistencies in the stories, but none of these stories come from eyewitnesses. In fact, they're very literarily crafted. Uh, we don't know their sources. They don't tell us their sources. Uh, and the only eyewitness source we do have is Paul, and he tells us that these were visions and revelations. He has no knowledge of any other kinds of experiences, and he doesn't give us any other kinds of reports. Uh, likewise, the empty tomb reports. Um, notably, in, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, clearly the problem had risen that people were, were blaming the Christians for having stolen the body. This was their excuse for trying to explain away the empty tomb. So Matthew invents guards. He says, no, no, they put guards at the empty tomb. Now notice in the Gospel of Mark, who's Ma who is Matthew's source, by the way. Matthew is embellishing and expanding on Mark. Mark has no knowledge of guards, but Mark also has no knowledge of there being an accusation of theft. So he doesn't even go through the bother of trying to explain away or try to create an apologetic to explain away this, this accusation that the Christians had stolen the body. That accusation clearly had not existed when Mark wrote this story. That, ex that, that sort of response occurred after, and then Matthew responded to it, which means that Mark made up the empty tomb story. Because Mark is writing some 40 years after the fact. If you think if you're evangelizing, you're telling this story for 40 years over three continents, obviously someone would have come up with this rebuttal at some point. And that, that response to that rebuttal, the story would be structured to respond to that rebuttal, would have happened decades before, Paul, or before Mark got to hold of the story. But Mark has no knowledge of this theft accusation, or of the, even the idea that that would be, oh, you know what, I probably should uh, put in some sort of like guards or something to, to prevent that uh, explanation from being possible. Mark didn't do that. Matthew did. I think that's just one among many pieces of evidence uh, that argues against the empty tomb story being original. In the epistles of Paul, Paul never mentions there being an empty tomb found, for example. And he says there's no reason why Paul would want to have this revelation. Well, that's not really true. If you read Romans 7 and 8, for example, Paul agonizes about how worried he was that Jewish law was so hard to follow that he was going to be doomed. Uh, and he, he was so glad that Christianity made it possible for him to uh, alleviate this anxiety because it means he didn't have to follow the Jewish law, that he could just be saved by Jesus Christ. That's a powerful motivator. If you're suffering this kind of anxiety, especially, and also adding to this, if you're persecuting people who are advocating this actually kind of loving, nice uh, theology, uh, you might start to feel guilty for having done that. And if you find their story is actually sort of the solution to your own anxieties about your own religion, well, these, these are powerful motivators. Uh, so we, we can come up with reasons why, even in the text of Paul, uh, he would convince himself uh, or uh, have this experience, to produce this experience in the subconscious. All right. I think I've gotten everything done. I'll leave it at that. Well, to this point, I've not yet heard any positive arguments for the non-existence of God. Again, I've offered six arguments for the existence of God. Those are, seem to be the arguments that Richard is replying to, but I've not yet heard arguments that specifically say, here's how we can know God does not exist. Uh, when we talk about the actual infinite, and Richard addresses that with geometric points on his hands, well, that's fine if you want to talk about geometric points. Geometric points are abstract objects. They don't exist in space. A point has no dimensionality. So Richard is conceding my point that the only things that can create something uh, like this are either abstract objects that don't exist in space, or we have a human mind. See, you can't say that a geometric point or an abstract object is able to create the universe. It just doesn't make sense. Now, uh, Richard says that we're not talking about counting to infinity. If, so what if we can't count to infinity? Well, let me ask you a question. What is time but the numbering of events? How else do you define time? I don't care if you number it by the second by the nanosecond, by the year, whatever it is, you define time as a numbering of events. It's a change in circumstances, and there's a discrete number of those. So to say even if we can't number infinity, it's still there, well, that's not true in respect to time, is it? Because time, by its nature, has to be numbered. Yesterday is negative one. The day before that is negative two. 
each time unit can be assigned a number. And therefore, if you have an infinite past, as I said, it's like jumping, trying to jump to the surface from a bottomless pit. You can never get there. The fine tuning of the universe. Uh, Richard didn't really talk about this a, a whole lot. He said that there's some objections that he has and that it's not uh, exactly clear. Well, there's a couple of things that are clear and that science is showing. There's another paper um, that we see that Dyson and his co-authors, one of which is Leonard Susskind, which is a very famous cosmologist, uh, have written entitled Disturbing Implications of a Cosmological Constant. Now, these are top physicists and cosmologists in their field. And they sought to explain how internal inflation, what we do observe, could generate a universe like ours. So they're just trying to understand what we could observe. Their conclusion that is, even if some type of eternal machine was producing universes, Ours would have to be the very first one. And the paper states, quote, another possibility is an unknown agent intervened in the evolution, and for this, reasons of its own, restarted the universe in a state of low entropy characterizing inflation. However, even this does not rid the theory of the pesky recurrences. Only the first occurrence would evolve in a way that would be consistent with usual expectations. So we don't have millions and millions and billions and billions of opportunities. Both Board, Guth, and Vilenkin, as well as Dyson and his cohorts, independently come to the idea that you have no escaping the beginning of the universe. If we do have multiple universes running, well, guess what? This is the first one. And the second question is, well, wait a minute, where did the laws, Richard, hit, if you remember, he had, uh, admitted himself that laws have to be based on something. So let's push it back a, a, a step. If the multiverse exists, what created that? What laws are, where did those laws come from? Why is the multiverse creating universes? Again, it becomes an infinite regress. You have to have a starting point. Okay. When we talk about life, Richard simply uh, really kind of dismisses life as a, as a simple putting together of the parts. Well, well, there's nothing simple about it. Have scientists in the lab recreated certain elementary cells? Absolutely. Let me ask you all a question. Are scientists alive? I think they are. What I'm saying is life doesn't come from non-life. You don't just throw some stuff in the middle of the room and wait. Now, Richard says, well, we can't do this, of course. We just don't have the time. It's impossible. Oh, so then you would agree that we've never observed life coming from non-life. It's reasonable, then, to assume that life always comes from life because we've never observed anything different. Anything else is just merely an assumption. It's a guess. When we talk about uh, consciousness and personhood, Richard has said what actually defines a person is that they have certain mental properties such as memories, reasoning skills, and character traits. He claims that even people in comas can still be considered people simply because they're not using their faculties, but they still exist, and this is in his book. But wait a minute. That statement contradicts what he said earlier. If the mind is merely electrical and chemical processes acting upon the brain, and those processes don't happen, then the person no longer exists. The personality, the personhood is gone, right? He's dead. Uh, a ripened tomato, for example, has a property of redness. Uh, but a tomato that never ripens never achieves that property. And a ripe tomato loses the property of greenness. You can't say that greenness still exists in a red tomato. It doesn't make sense. Either character traits like this are transitory, they come and they go, uh, and there's no objective to, way to define what a person is, what a life is, what a mind is, or these traits exist objectively outside of a material explanation. You can't have it both ways. You can't say people in a coma who aren't using these processes are still alive, are still persons, and at the same time say, uh, if those processes happen in a corpse, well, then they're no longer a corpse. They're actually a person again. Well, the problem of physicalism. The, the biggest problem in this whole uh, issue of life and the mind being merely a, an assumption of physical parts, then you would imagine that the less material you have, the less of, uh, of a person you would have. Take any object that's missing a piece, and it'll never be considered as valuable as the same object with all its pieces, uh, right? I mean, a four-wheeled car that only has three wheels, that's going to be pretty hard to sell. Um, it's less than fully functioning. However, people with amputations don't become less human than those with four fully functioning limbs. Now, I didn't talk about 
uh, dividing the brain in half. That wasn't the example I used. I used hemispherectomy, where one half of the brain is entirely removed, gone. The half of the brain fills with uh, spinal fluid. There's no organ there to exist, and these people are still becoming master bowlers and chess champions. So if physicalism is true, how do we explain this? Also, if physicalism is true, what makes us all equal? I mean, think about it. If intelligence is valued in our society, then people who are smarter uh, should be more valuable than people who are dumb. People who obey the law should be more valuable than people who are criminals. This is the exact type of thinking that created the eugenics movement in the 20th century, reducing people to their physical parts. This is a, up until recently as 1972, the less desirables were forcibly sterilized so they wouldn't reproduce more of their kind. Uh, Secondly, or lastly, I should say, um, he talks about organ donors, how he doesn't want this to happen to us. Notice the moral language. We want. This isn't good. Uh, really, when you start appealing to these things in this way, you're either appealing to a personal idea or you're conceding my point that it shouldn't happen. So in all of these things, we can see that there either is moral values or uh, we're left with personal choices. And as I said before, if the uh, desires of happiness, if the definition of what is happy changes, then morality goes right out the window. And that's where we would stand. Thank you. He said we have not heard any positive arguments for atheism. I've actually given several. Um, I'll revisit them as we go through. Uh, first, but first of all, remi let me remind you, we don't need them. Uh, if, if he's saying that there are aliens in this room or there are aliens visiting us, I don't need to disprove that. He needs to prove it. So that the whole idea that I have to prove atheism is not really true. Nevertheless, uh, I gave arguments from the brain. Uh, the brain is something we wouldn't need if God existed, but it is something we would actually would have to have if God does not exist because a complex brain is the only way we could exist, the only way our consciousness could exist if there is no God. So the godless hypothesis, atheism, actually predicts a large complex brain. And look, boom, a large complex brain. God hypothesis does not predict that. Biogenesis is the same way. I gave the same example, the fact that the life began really super simple and took three billion years to evolve the complexity enough to actually have a multi-celled organism. Three billion years, that's a really long time. That's a lot of evolution going on. Um, that's exactly what we'd have to see if there is no God, because that's the only way complex life could have evolved. The only way uh, we could be here is if we were at the end of a really long string of processes like that. But on the God hypothesis, that doesn't necessarily follow. And then I gave the argument from cosmological, cosmological scale, the fact that the universe is so vast, so old, and almost entirely inhospitable to life. That's exactly the only universe we would expect to find ourselves in if God does not exist. We can actually predict all of those features of the universe from the assumption that God does not exist. Uh, but from the assumption that God does exist, we can't predict those features. You can make up excuses. You can say, well, God wanted it that way. But notice how convenient that is, that God wanted to make a universe that looks exactly like the universe would look if there was no God in it. That's a weird desire to have. Uh, and so you're really just sort of begging the question there. He talks about uh, geometric points don't exist in space. Yes, they do. Um, the, 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 there are an infinite number of points on my thumb. I mean, that's... Uh, just the fact that they're uh, infinitely small, in fact, that they're zero-dimensional, doesn't mean they're not there. In fact, calculus is based on the mathematical principle that you can add them all up and get an actual area. Uh, this has been known since Archimedes, in fact. Uh, is there a number for every point in time? Yes, actually, there are infinitely many numbers. So we could number time in principle if we had infinite amount of time to do it. Uh, but again, humans, if you're talking about humans actually going through the trouble of putting labels, like I'm going to number this point in time, this number, and so on, Humans labeling it that, yes, we're limited. We, we don't have infinite time. We're finite beings. We have limitations. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a number, some number, that we could be assigned to every single point in time if there's an infinite string. So that doesn't make any sense to say that that's illogical. Um, he talks about Kuskin, or Suskin's argument. Uh, the fact is there are scientists, cosmological scientists, who doubt whether there even is a cosmological constant. But the fact of the matter is if it's too small, uh, the universe collapses. If it's too big, the universe explodes. And this, again, cr starts the whole process over again. Once you have a collapse, you have another Big Bang. Once you have an explosion, you actually probably have multiple Big Bangs. So again, this is just re this is hitting the reset button over time. And their actual arguments, uh, are even Vilenkin's argument, is based on the fact that there is a huge string of universes, but it's a finite string. That's his argument. But nevertheless, we have a huge number of universes in line, and we could be one of the ones uh, towards the end of it. And he says we would have to be at the beginning of it. Uh, there are a lot of cosmological scientists who disagree with this argument. Uh, so it's not really a settled point. 
Uh, he says we didn't have bill millions and billions of opportunities. Well, there's another reason. Not only could we be at the end of a string of a very large finite uh, series of universes, but also, uh, according to, like, for example, chaotic inflation theory, when the big, our Big Bang occurred, in fact, it generated huge numbers of universes, of which ours is just one. And those other universes are really, really far away. We can't see them. So in fact, we could have billions of universes that all did begin at the exact same point in time as our universe. Uh, there's nothing to really prevent this, and they could all have different cosmological constants. They could all have different other constants. These are possibilities. We don't have any particular reason to rule them out. Uh, and he says, um, where does the universe come from then? Uh, well, it comes from quantum fluctuations, uh, basic physics. Remember, if the decision is that something has to exist for no reason, and we have the option of a simple quantum mechanical vacuum, or a mind that has the specified complexity of 10 to the power of 5 million, which one of those do you think is inherently more likely? Well, first of all, the, simple, the much simpler one is more likely, the, the simple quantum vacuum. And we can explain everything uh, with that. Uh, and, and just that kind of thing can actually generate, for example, chaotic inflation, generate billions of universes, and of which ours would be one. And the key, thing, the key thing here is not only is that the prior probability favoring the atheist hypothesis, but the evidential probability is as well, because again, the universe is exactly the only universe we could ever find ourselves in if, if atheism is true. Uh, it, it, this is, we would have a vast universe, vastly huge, vastly old, uh, mostly lethal to life, almost entirely lethal to life. That's the universe we would expect to see. So that actually confirms that it was probably a simple quantum vacuum and not a mind who wanted to make a perfect universe for us. And he talks about, uh, kind of confusingly, about uh, whether, why I think a person in a coma is a person, but a corpse is not. A person in a coma, their chemistry set's still running. Uh, your, your cells are still maintaining their, their equilibrium. Uh, your brain is still working. Not necessarily actually actively thinking about things, but nevertheless, all the parts are there. Your personality is there. Your memories are there. And it's all living, and all you got to do is wake it up, essentially. And in fact, a corpse brain is the same way if we had the technology to wake it up. We can wake coma patients up. We haven't figured out how to wake up dead people, but that's going to happen 50 years from now. Probably death is going to be a thing of the past because we'll have the technology to simply wake you up uh, from your corpse state. Uh, and in that case, uh, the person is still going to be there in the corpse state. Uh, in fact, it is, really, if you die, you're, all your personality and features and stuff are still there. Uh, we, just can't, we just can't rescue them. Uh, and so that's, that's the only reason why we consider that a person who's dead. Uh, he also mentions uh, the origin of life. Is science alive, or uh, are scientists alive? Uh, this kind of misses the point of my argument. Uh, the fact that scientists can make simple self-replicators does not prove what he's saying, uh, that life always comes from life. Life always comes from life? No, that's not true. All it shows is that, uh, that right now, if you want to make it happen really quickly, it comes from life, which is exactly what we'd expect on the God hypothesis. But on the atheist hypothesis, you need billions of years to do it. Lo and behold, look at the evidence. It took billions of years. That looks like a godless universe, not a, a god one. Um, physicalism, uh, less material, less person. Uh, that's, that's true. If you take away enough parts, you're not going to have a person left. Uh, and he says he was talking about hemispherectomy. Even people with hemispherectomies have lost all the information and abilities that were unique to that hemisphere. The fact that we have redundancies in our brain, where our, uh, two halves of our brain can perform a lot of the same functions as each other, doesn't prove non-physicalism. All it proves is that we have redundancies in the brain, which we know physically from uh, neurology and so on. If you, keep, if you take their remaining half and start cutting pieces away, eventually they're, they're going to stop functioning altogether. Uh, he uses eugenics as an argument against uh, my moral theory. Uh, but this is just another situation where, is that the society we want to live in? Are those the sorts of people we want to be? No. And that's the reason why his argument is persuasive to you, or sounds persuasive, because we find that repugnant. Yeah, we find that repugnant. That's why we don't want to be that. Uh, so again, he's, he's just appealing to your own desires, which is what I'm appealing to as well. There's no difference there. And uh, the fact of the matter is, the good versus bad, good things are things that are good for us. That's a physical objective fact. There are objectively f facts about what are things are good for you and what things are bad for you, or for our society, good for our society, or good for your neighbors, and so on. And we, have to, we do have to choose. He says it's a matter of choice. Yeah, we have to choose which one of those societies, which one of those worlds we want to be living in, what sorts of person, whether a good person or a bad person, which sort of person we want to be, and which is going to work out best for us in the end. And really, if you look, do the math, you look at the physics, you look at the sociology, uh, the best way to live is as a moral person in a moral society. Thank you.
Well, you'll remember in my opening speech tonight that I made two primary contentions. Number one, that there are good reasons to believe in the existence of God. And number two, that there are no good reasons to believe in the non-existence of God. That's what I was arguing. To my first contention, there are strong reasons to believe in the existence of God. I offered six lines of evidence, each with supporting facts uh, by modern science and uh, thinkers. The universe was created at some point in the past. Bangs have bangers. And big bangs would have big bangers. Uh, the universe is finely tuned for advanced life. And fine tuning always requires a fine tuner. Life has appeared on earth and life only comes from life. We've never observed anything else. We've never observed consciousness coming from anything but other conscious entities. We've never observed anything other than this. Objective morality exists. I think we can agree on that. But objective morality, not subjective morality, must come from an objective moral lawgiver. The resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth is a real event rooted in history. Now, to my second contention, I left it to Richard to provide evidence for God's existence. He says he doesn't have to do that. I think when you're making an assertion, such as the assertion that uh, there is no such thing as an all-encompassing mind, you need to provide evidence for that. Uh, and he's given us objections that he doesn't think the universe should take this long. He doesn't think the universe should be this big. He doesn't think morality should work this way. Well, these are opinions. These are not real reasons. Uh, so I don't think he's proven his, his case. Um, now, for you, you might have come here tonight with your mind made up. You might have come looking for answers to your questions. There's another way that we can settle this uh, question, and you can settle it yourself in a way that could be more real and personal than you would have ever thought possible. Now, look, I'm not a perfect person. I've struggled with the idea and of uh, God and doubt. I've had to look into the evidence. Heck, I didn't come from an evangelical home. I had to wrestle with what to believe and what not to believe. Uh, I looked at the arguments and studied the facts. Those are not my strongest reasons for being a Christian today. My strongest reasons for being a Christian is because Jesus Christ made himself real to me. I knew there was a moral law, and I really tried to keep it. <laughs> Forget God's law. I tried to keep the law that I would set for other people, and I'd still fail miserably. I knew I should be judged. I was a sinner. I couldn't even keep my own standards. And how can a holy God allow any sin to go unjudged? God doesn't give you a pass. He doesn't let some evil slide. However, as I said, the facts also showed that Jesus really did live and he really did rise from the dead. Because of that, he's proven his authority on how a sinner like me can be reconciled to a holy God. He said that God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, the only one who could bear our sins and pay for them. I accepted Jesus, the one who can provide the righteousness that I lacked. He was the one who could make me experience God personally, not just by facts, but in a real, tangible way. Now, it's one thing to know all the history and trivia of a person, even a famous person, say Robert Downey Jr. Um, but you know, if you know Robert Downey Jr., if you're friends with him, then he's more real than any mere list of facts could ever be. When my wife was in the hospital on her deathbed, I couldn't understand what was going on. I didn't know what God was doing, but I knew God. And I knew the evidence. I could trust that he would bring us through it. And you can have that same knowledge of God today. You do not have to be constantly searching for facts upon facts. Now, facts are important. They inform our beliefs. I think the six facts I offer tonight are good ones. They're strong ones. Um, they inform a reasonable case to the best explanation of why things are the way they are. You can go beyond the facts to know the God of the universe personally and directly. I would challenge you to do that. I would say you should ask God. When you lay your head on the pillow tonight, ask him to reveal himself to you. He will. Jesus says whoever comes to him, he will in no way cast out. The fact of his existence will become evident, and in that, the world can finally make sense. Thank you. Well, I'd like to close by telling you all, um, obviously none of this can be resolved in a debate like this. Uh, it's a short amount of time, uh, we're racing against the clock, a lot of things that we can't say. 
keep, keep checking, keep researching, read books on both sides of the argument. Uh, read their best, read our best. Uh, keep learning about this. Uh, any particular question you have, figure out what both sides say on the matter before coming to a decision. Uh, so keep doing that. I hope this debate will inspire you to do that. Um, he, he, let's, I'll reiterate the six points in response to his six points. Um, th the bottom line is uh, he didn't really resolve the fact that we're not really sure whether the universe had a beginning or ta all time had a beginning or not. Uh, the science is unclear. Uh, there's, there's uncertainty in the matter. Logic doesn't really give us a solution. So we don't know. Uh, fine tuning, he says, always requires a fine tuner. He didn't really prove that. And as a matter of logic, it's false. I mean, obviously you can get a random accident that can produce fine tuning. Uh, so it's not necessarily the case that you have to have a fine tuner. Uh, the question is, which was it? Was it a, a chance accident? Is it, is it uh, you know, an accident or is it by design? That's the only question you have to resolve. And to answer that question, you have to look at the evidence. And I talked to you about what, what the evidence points to in that case. Uh, he also says, um, we've never observed life or consciousness coming from non-life or non-consciousness. Uh, and I pointed out that these, these things aren't really correct. Um, they're not something that we can expect. I mean, first of all, consciousness comes from sperm and egg, which are not conscious. Uh, so that's actually false. And even as a matter of logic, uh, obviously you could throw all the components of a brain together and get a, a functioning person. So you don't need a conscious mind to actually physically, intelligently assemble a brain to make it an, a conscious person. No, the chemistry set does that uh, unintelligently all by itself. And life as well. Uh, we, we, I've made the point that if you have plenty of time, you have billions of years, enough chemistry sets running, you can get these random chemicals that we have actually confirmed are very simple. Uh, so there's nothing to prevent that from happening. And in fact, that we would expect the universe to be huge to make that possible, and that's what we observe. And he's, he says something about objective moral values. He tries to turn this into subjective moral values because it's based on what we want in life, but that's not really true. They are objective. In fact, in the end of Christianity, which is one of the books I'm selling today, not only do I have my, my extensive discussion of the design argument that we've talked about today, but I also have my chapter, oh, and also, by the way, on the resurrection of Jesus, I have my definitive, or one of my definitive treatments of that subject in the origins of Christianity. But with regard to the moral theory, I also have a chapter on that, on why there are objective, true moral facts, but they come from the facts of the world and the facts of, of your nature. For example, you have to breathe and you have to eat to live. So morality stems from that. You have to, for example, taking food and air away from someone is actually depriving them of something. That's an objective fact. And then if you're going to, you can look at structures of societies. If you have a society structured a certain way where people are routinely taking food and water or food and breathing air from people, that's a society that you're not going to want to live in. That's going to be a dysfunctional society. It's going to be an unhappy society. And that's an objective fact. Uh, that's why, like, for example, Marxist societies don't work. Uh, and that's an objective fact of the world. So you have to decide whether you want to live in a society that's not going to work or if you want to live in a society that is going to work and make everybody a happier person and uh, enjoying their society better. Uh, he kind of dropped the resurrection point. Um, I, I'll just direct you to my writings on this. Uh, the evidence is simply not sufficient to establish that there is a supernatural uh, explanation for the evidence that we have for this. Uh, there are many resurrected gods in antiquity. Um, Jesus is just one of them. Uh, so this, this isn't really uh, an unusual or supernatural thing. It's, it's a, a cultural product. Uh, he concluded by preaching a bit for uh, his religion. Of course, you can hear all of the same testimony from any of, every other religion. Taoists could come up here and give you a testimony just like that. Buddhists could, Mormons could, uh, ancient pagans could have done. Uh, I'm going to give you a little preach. I'm going to preach a little for atheism. Um, what, what does atheism tell us? If you, if you become godless like me, uh, one of the things that you're going to realize is that you better figure out how this world works and how the human brain works and how the human mind works. You have to understand yourself. You have to understand people. You have to understand the world uh, because that's, that's your Bible, right? That's how you figure out how things work and how to, how to navigate this world and make good decisions for the future. But more importantly, if there is no God, we only have each other. Think about that. If there's problems you want to solve, if there's things that make you miserable, if there are things that bring you agony about this world, the only people who can fix those things is us. Thank you.